So I'm talking about unpacking the teacher in a box. Um, in order to work about this, I'm sorry, but we do need to go back in time just a little bit. Although this is technically the first year of my PhD, I've actually been working with this project for about three and a half years now. So the teacher in a box is a program I stumbled upon by accident. It involved a large number of people and several bottles of wine. There are many stories involved with this, but they don't need to be done, gone into in detail. What is the teacher in a box? The Teacher in a Box is a project that came out of the mind of one Jeanette Johnson in uh, Brisbane. She and a group of volunteers collect old laptops rather than send them to e-waste. They take these old laptops, they wipe the hard drives, then fill them with educational resource materials and get them out to different places which is a pretty simple concept in and of itself. Uh, they also attach a dongle to them to try and turn this laptop into a Wi-Fi point of its own, which can technically, according to the stats, hold up to 300 connections. In reality, probably only about 150 within line of sight. This becomes an offline internet server that is filled with OER. So the original build was taken from the Rachel project, uh, contained the same sort of material as you would find on what's currently on Rachel. Some of it is also with the e-granary build and some of it is in the solar spell build as well. Uh, fairly standard stuff, um, some good, some bad, and it looked very much like what you've got on the screen there. So what was my original task with those guys? To have a look at it, to seek, find, share, enjoy, and hopefully learn something. Well, I did. The teacher in a box at the time of the original study had only gone out to some 17 countries. There are a few extra countries you can't see on the map because, well, they're tiny Pacific Island nations. Uh, the initial research came down to what do you actually do with these? Well, came back that a lot of these things were being taken out to schools, to community centres, and they're being used for very simple things for watching a video on there or to read a book. And this is for the teachers to read a book. And he said, well, well, what can we do to make them better? As you can see, the, the first thing, some of the things that were very simple came up as infrastructure issues at the school end or at the user end. Other things were things like lack of connection to curriculum and how long it takes you to find anything because there was quite simply no search function. So the result of the first set of study was to create a baseline curriculum just based on the literacy levels within each text and to put in a search function. So that brings us up to now because this first bit of research was completed in early 2020. And what, happened, what has happened since then? Well, there has been what can only be described as an explosion and what's available in OER. The boxes now have the new baseline curriculum included. They have updated content. They have a new search function being included. And they have a massive upswing in need because a lot of the world's aid has been moved away from education and educational resources and over to other projects. Still just as vital, but it takes it away from this. Which brings us to the next problem. How can we make the content of these things more accessible when you can't access the users? The reality is these teacher in a box computers are very often the only computer within a school, a village, or in the case of some of these areas, an island. Which means the users have a very limited level of digital literacy. Now, within the teacher in a box computers, there are different programs to help you with you, you know, uh, to help you to learn more about digital literacy, but you need a certain amount of digital literacy in order to access those programs. And then you see our volunteers. This is actually three of the most regular volunteers. They spend their time, money, getting the devices to these places. They are not teachers. 
They are not technicians. They cannot teach people the skills of digital literacy. They cannot teach the different pedagogical skills that are needed to work with the types of resources that are in these boxes, which are different to the skills that the teachers, some of whom are trained, many of whom have limited levels of training, have when they receive them. So the solutions that are most commonly used when you're talking teacher training are to bring groups of teachers to a central location and train them en masse, or to send trainers out to individual schools and to train them in smaller groups, or these days to use digital training on a mass online communications platform. But with the places that the teacher in a box gets sent to, well, we've got a few things to get in the way of that. Geography, economy, and infrastructure being just your basics. So my research is looking at, well, how can we get the training to the people who need it to make this thing more effective and more useful than just being a shiny doorstop. So what's involved in this? Well, the current plan, and like I said, I'm in the first year, so this is still very much in the plan, is there is a deployment of teacher in a box units that will be sent out to a single country. At the moment, it's Fiji. It was originally Vanuatu, but timing got mixed up. Uh, that goes out to schools in need. Only volunteer schools are engaged with this. The teachers who get these do all get the same baseline training in how to access and use the box. They also do a survey. Now this is based on the technology access, sorry, I keep forgetting what that means, uh, technology access model and how they want to, how they use technology and how they feel about it. They then have access to both digital literacy or pedag and pedagogy training in different modes, either in paper, in computer form, on a USB drive, or in mixed modes. All of these forms have feedback loops built in and surveys along the way. And there is a final survey. It's all done at your own pace. It's designed to be small modules, bite-sized, based on the knowledge that teachers do not have the time to sit down and spend an hour learning something, but do have the time for five minutes. Particularly if that five minutes will then be able to be used effectively soon after. The training also includes, like I said, things on how to check your skills, to check the changes of attitudes, to check the language of instruction that teachers are accessing, because many of the countries that these devices go to use multiple languages of instruction. Also looking at which particular modules they access more often, confirming how num the actual number of modules accessed and feedback for the teachers on their skill improvement. Why is this of any value? Well, because digital learning is here to stay. We're never going to get away from it. The digital divide was always there and has only become more apparent over the last 18 months. And this is possibly one way to help decrease it. And will it be used? Well, yes, because quite frankly, the teacher in a box group have already said they're going to use it. They're that's where I've got the support to do the research from because this group have already taken the first set of research to use it and now want to use the second set even before I've done it. So I'm kind of having to hold them back a bit. That's where I'm at at this point. So it's um, time for questions. All right, so um, my name is Evelyn Oye Tete. I'm a librarian in Ghana and I'm doing a PhD in the University of South Africa. My topic is using open educational resources to advance higher education in Ghana. This is a very broad topic and it gives me the leeway to change perspectives and my focus when necessary. I'm actually at the beginning stage, the thought formation stage of my research so I have done a lot of changes. And even yesterday, after I was done with the slides and I was going through, 
I realized that I need to make some changes. At the end of the day, I changed the purpose statement a little bit. And so what I have, which you have read, what, what I have, which you have read, which I'm, I'm presenting now is different from what you have mentioned. Okay, but I hope that the change is not much. So I believe that um, it will not be too different from what you anticipated. So my study is on using open educational resources to advance higher education, that's the topic. But what I'm presenting on as the purpose statement is investigating the role of academic libraries in the adoption, creation, and use of open educational resources in higher education institutions in Ghana. For my overview, I am looking at three issues, which pertains to the provision of education, uh, teaching and learning resources in Ghana, three issues or three problems when it comes to the provision of teaching and learning resources in Ghana. The first is lack of academic, lack of suitable teaching and learning resources, sorry. Now academic libraries and institutions are faced with this problem of lack of suitable teaching and learning resources, especially the distance education program are facing this issue. And studies have shown that the distance education program in Ghana is being done in person with print materials and sometimes videos of pre-recorded lectures to support the in-person delivery. But we all know that this is not supposed to be so for distance education. Distance education needs more than this. Distance education should be able to harness technology and advanced media to create synchronous and interactive experience for both students and lecturers. Then the second situation is lack of contextually appropriate teaching and learning resources. In Ghana, most of our textbooks or teaching materials are foreign based. They come with their own practices and examples or scenarios, which do not pertain to what we have in Ghana. And a perfect example is the use of images of Caucasian parents, patients, sorry, to teach dermatology. And this is problematic because the disease manifests differently in the dark skins of patients that the students need when they go to the hospital. Then the third is a lack of adequate library resources due to cost. And we are all aware of the issue of increasing cost of textbooks. Uh, the situation or the story is not different from what we have here in Ghana. Research has shown that academic libraries are not able to afford educational materials due to budget constraints. So what has been done about the situation so far? The studies have shown that most academic libraries in Ghana provide access to online resources like books and journals to support distance education. Then from my review, I've realized that two OER initiatives in Ghana that is the TSSA and then PHEAETR initiatives that are being done in two of the institutions. And these institutions happen to have distance education programs running. Um, the institutions harness these projects to support the distance education programs. But later is not about how the situation is being addressed at other institutions that also offer distance education program. To realize that the situation is still pending, it's not fully resolved. Then also when it comes to a lack of contextually um, appropriate resources, 
research has all, again shown that one of the reasons why some lecturers in the health sciences uh, developed interest in the African Health Network OER initiative was to address this challenge. So the initiative, the OER, this OER initiative seems to be helping in that way. However, the problem will still persist in other disciplines that still use the foreign textbooks. We have the human sciences, we have the applied sciences. Even with the health sciences that has the African Health Network initiative, uh, OER initiative, it is not all the fields in health sciences that use this initiative. So many more uh, disciplines still use the contextually inappropriate resources and something has to be done. Then the last bit is the inadequate library materials due to cost. And studies again indicate that academic libraries try to make a case for continuous subscription of so expensive uh, resources uh, by evaluating usage. Unfortunately, we know that this is not sustainable at all. So what is sustainable? OER is the sustainable solution. And OER has proven, as we have read in many of the studies done, um, especially in Europe and America, they were able to embrace OER and now they are reaping the full benefits in terms of making uh, savings on, on the cost of textbooks. Other academic institutions also use OER repositories to provide access to learning materials without cost. And studies also identify OER and MOOCs as resources that can support distance education, design and open education. So OER has entered into the mainstream of higher education and academic libraries have also found the opportunity to support the agenda. Now, at the early stages, libraries were called upon to offer support in areas such as advocacy, seeking, fan seeking, OER selection, metadata and indexing, discovery, privacy, preservation, copyright, licensing, advisory, policy development, among others. In subsequent studies, libraries follow suit to offer services in those areas, the responsibilities that are mentioned. And some libraries even use their institutional repositories to host OERs for their institution. Unfortunately, the story is not the same in Ghana. OER adoption and use in Africa in general is still emerging. And most of the existing literature are centered on adoption and use of faculty and use of OER by faculty and students. So far, I found only two studies discussing libraries involvement in OER in East Africa. And in Ghana, very little is written about academic libraries involvement in OER. And there's a gap that this study is to fill. In view of this, I'll investigate the role of academic libraries in the adoption, creation, and use of OERs in higher education institutions in Ghana. Now, what is the problem? Even though OER has moved into the mainstream of academic librarianship in Europe and Africa, in Europe and US, academic libraries in Ghana are yet to be involved in OER. And this is supported by a study in 2010 that lack of system for OER dissemination in, the, in a university and the country generally is a constraint on OER projects in Ghana. This is serious. And it shows that librarians are not really involved in OER because the issue of dissemination is, is in the domain of libraries. 
So my research questions are, are academic librarians aware of OERs? How do academic librarians perceive the usefulness of OERs in higher education? How do academic librarians contribute to the adoption, creation, and use of OERs in Ghanaian universities? Four factors can aid academic libraries to support OER adoption, creation, and use in higher education institutions in Ghana. What benefits and challenges are associated with academic library support for OER adoption, creation, and use in higher education institutions in Ghana? For my scope, I'll be dealing with now, and um, I have selected four institutions based on their involvement in OER. Now engage professional librarians and lecturers who are into OERs or are engaged in OER. So I'm doing this method, I'll collect data the qualitative and quantitative data. With the qualitative data, I'll do interview with open-ended questions. I have sample, possibly sample forehead librarians for that purpose. And I will do thematic analysis with Atlas TI. With the quantitative data, I'll do a semi-structured questionnaire for 313 professional librarians out of 384, and for 156 lecturers involved in OER out of 522. And I'll be using random sampling for that. For analysis, I'll do descriptive mean and standard deviation analysis with SPSS. So for the significance, Okay, the study will add to the existing scanty body of knowledge that we have now in Ghana on OER. When the services of academic libraries will be improved, the challenge of lack of textbooks and unavailability of materials with local content will also be addressed. The students will have access to free teaching and learning materials tailored to suit the non context. Online and distance learners will now have access to suitable materials that will facilitate synchronous and interactive experience. Finally, the availability of OER online will enhance teaching experience of the lectures. And this is my bibliography. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So I'm so excited to talk about Ready or We Are Not today. This is a course that I've developed for uh, K-12 educators. That's primary and secondary, elementary, middle, and high school. I know we've got a lot of different systems in the room today, um, but basically everything before you get to higher education. My name is Emily Helton. I work at Fairmont State University as part of a grant that uh, facilitates the Katherine Johnson NASA Independent Verification and Validation Facilities Education Resource Center. So we do everything from teacher development courses like this to running our state's competitive robotics programs to um, our million dollar equipment loan program where teachers in West Virginia can borrow uh, equipment from us for free to STEM events, which I'm actually ducking out of one right now that our office is running. We have our annual day in the park for today in the past two days for middle school students to learn about careers in STEM in the state of West Virginia. I'm also a PhD student at West Virginia University in the Educational Theory and Practice Program. Uh, my email is down there and I would love to hear from anyone at any time. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was just why OER in K-12. I know that a lot of OER adoption measures are done at higher ed in response to textbook costs, but I think there's a real need in K-12 as well to start talking about these things. 
Um, we do have textbooks in K-12, but at least in the United States, the market is really skewed towards um, as general as possible. So these publishers can sell their textbooks in as many markets as possible. And a lot of times it's driven by larger states like California and Texas. Texas has statewide textbook adoption. So if a publisher can sell their book in Texas, they're like set. No one has West Virginia in mind when they're writing textbooks except for our West Virginia history books. Um, so finding ways to um, make the material make more sense for our students, finding ways for it to align better with what we're doing. Our standards in uh, West Virginia are similar to, to the national standards, but they are um, often not arranged the same way. So for example, one of the teachers who's taken this course with me, um, he teaches seventh and eighth grade science. And um, the eighth grade standards include stuff that's in the eighth grade textbook, the seventh grade textbook, and the sixth grade textbook. So his solution is either to have a class set and then of each of those, those grade levels and then not be able to send kids home with their textbooks, or he can try to convince his district to buy him three copies of a textbook for each kid in his classroom, which is just not a winning proposition. So in response to this, teachers have to supplement and adapt the materials that they have. And that supplementation can come through OER, which I think is the best route. It can come through teachers making their own materials, which is also a fantastic route, or it can come from purchasing materials on portals like Teachers Pay Teachers and things like that. So if we can increase OER at the K-12 level and, and increase its use and adoption, it's in terms of practicality, I think one of our better solutions. And I argue that there's also an equity piece to it as well. If our students in West Virginia aren't seeing themselves in science or aren't, aren't seeing themselves in their subjects, they're internalizing messages about what they can and cannot do. And so making the, the books more student-centered, um, making the materials that they're working with actually reflect them and giving them a voice in those materials is something that I feel really strongly about. Um, I was a classroom teacher for eight years, sort of split evenly between special education and science ed. Um, I taught every grade level except for six, not out of any bias. That's just how it shook out. Um, and one of my students who is a middle schooler, um, they, we were talking about glaciation and how if you've ever been to West Virginia or seen pictures, we're the only state in the United States that is entirely within the Appalachian Mountains. And it is so hilly and bumpy here. Something can be uh, two miles away from you as the crow flies and it takes 25 minutes to get there because there's no roads that connect you over mountains, um, which is fantastic. That's our experience. This is the landscape that they live with. So this example of talking about glaciation, one of the students in my class had relatives in the Midwest, which is entirely flat because of glaciation. It's just scraped the landscape. So you can see for miles in every direction. Um, and they had this aha moment of like, oh, that's why it's flat over there. And if we can build, if I could build on their experience and say, hey, bring me some pictures from your last family vacation to the Midwest, we'll add them to our materials and that'll be something other students can learn from. Um, it just goes a long way towards making this something that students can connect with and something that's more personal. All right. So a lot of professional development is sort of theory poor. Um, I've been in a lot of, of trainings and, and professional learning uh, situations where the presenter will say, these are evidence-based practices and then tell you what to do. And that is not the kind of professional development I'm interested in. So I wanted to make sure that this course was really grounded in some educational theories that would let teachers think about why they're doing what they're doing. And so the three that I settled on um, were communities of practice, funds of knowledge, and third space. Um, communities of practice, just briefly, is this idea that as we learn something, we're taking on an identity as part of a community. Um, funds of knowledge and third space play really nicely together and support each other. Um, and funds of knowledge especially comes out of fighting against deficit narratives about our kids, which is really even more essential right now, I think, than it has been. Um, 
I've, I've heard learning loss more times than I care to think about. Um, and that just seems like a really, um, it, it's, it's not a great framing for thinking about how kids have survived a global pandemic at the least. Um, so having these sort of frameworks that allow teachers to think about their resources that their students are already bringing with them to the classroom um, and how they can build on those resources is a really important underpinning of this course. For nuts and bolts, if you want to see the syllabus, that short link down there, the bit.ly will take you there. It is case sensitive if you're typing it in. If you've got the slides downloaded, you should just be able to click on it. Um, this is my favorite format for doing teacher professional development. Uh, it allows for a really long amount of time so that teachers can continue to re-engage with these ideas, but it's concentrated in the summer when teachers have more time because they aren't teaching. Um, I'm not going to say they're not working because almost all teachers I know are working over the summer, but if even if it's just doing a professional development course like this. So the summer session, five modules spread out over two weeks. Um, that's five synchronous video meetings and also some time for teachers to work on their own. Then when it gets to the fall, they can choose whether they want to enroll in the course for continuing ed credit or not. They've already done 80% of the work. So our fall session is just some meetings that they kind of set the agendas for and decide what we're doing that offer them those opportunities to re-engage with the idea. Okay, um, this is the sort of layout of the modules as we go through them. Um, start out with talking about communities of practice, having the educators pick a unit that they've taught before that they don't really feel like it works well or that they know they want to improve on as their starting point. And then throughout the course, they sort of take that unit and build on it using some OER and OEP to make it be something that's better and more engaging for their students. The second day is really just the nuts and bolts of what OER is, getting familiar with Creative Commons licensing and how to use that. Um, day three, we talk about open education practices. Um, that could be textbook rewriting, it could be Wikipedia editing, it could be overdubbing video, any of those sort of non-disposable assignments where the work that students are doing is something that they have an authentic audience for, either among their classmates or among the broader community online or in the next year's class who will use their materials as their starting point to, to jump off on their own explorations. Um, the fourth day, we're talking more about um, some different theories, talking about universal design for learning, which is so critical. Um, and then the fifth day is really just some accountability space. They can drop in and ask questions. At the end of the day, we kind of share with each other where we're at and what our next plans are. Um, this is not enough time to really like entirely develop a robust unit. So this is a let's get it to where it's at and then we'll see um, what, what our next goals are for it. Just to share a couple of the resources that I found really helpful for the K-12 side of things. Um, my two favorite are CK-12 and Better Lesson. CK-12 started out as a science um, digital textbook. They have embedded videos and simulations. They've spread out to other content areas now as well. And they have a, lot of, a pretty large library. Um, the science resources are still the best in my opinion, but they do have other offerings as well. They are Creative Commons licensed, um, but it can be a little bit harder to remix. They want you to use their system. Um, they have an embedded LMS and it's really nice. It offers a heat map of where your students are and how they're doing in the content. Um, but they, they have this thing called Flexbooks where you can edit their text and sort of move things around um, as it fits your particular curriculum or your scope and sequence. Um, but it can it can be harder to get things off of their site. So that's my my caveat with CK12. Uh, better lesson, they do a lot of different things, but my favorite thing is they have this huge repository of lesson plans written by great teachers. Um, they are all CC licensed and it varies from teacher to teacher how that what what license they've chosen. But these are usually lessons that are embedded in unit plans. And so you could have, you know, six lessons about a particular topic that go through from introducing it to the kids' final projects. Anything that's digital is included in there. So that's assignments, card sorts, whatever it is. Um, so it's a ton of stuff that teachers can grab and use. 
And then that long link at the bottom is something that we're collaborating on as part of the Ready or Not course um, to list some K-12 friendly repositories and sites, places to find media, those kind of things. That is an editable link. So when you go to the Google Doc, you can play around with it. So far it's worked out okay, but no problems or we'll see what happens. All right, our fall sessions, what the teachers in my group decided that they wanted was they wanted each week, uh, each meeting that we would talk about some educational theory that I would bring. I would share an OER source and an ed tech tool. On their side, they would bring, bring problems that they had in their classroom that we could discuss as a group and kind of use each other's expertise to, to help out with these types of things. I'm not, this is like my pre-pilot study. So this isn't like officially research research yet. Um, so I'm not comfortable saying this is findings. These are just some lessons that I have learned through this. Um, when we're talking to teachers about problems, the biggest things they cite are differentiation and motivation. Um, all of the teachers that I am working with have students in their classroom who can't read grade level content to get information from it. And they've got kids in their classrooms who could probably be teaching the content as well. So the, the wide variety of student um, background knowledge, interests, abilities as they're coming into the classroom is one of the things they cite as the biggest issue. And to me, that is a problem that OER can help to move towards. If we can have good differentiated texts, which we can either make ourselves or can crowdsource and, and collaborate on together, that's a huge barrier to students who can't access that grade level text or who need that more challenging, more content, like more, more enriching kind of experience as well. Motivation, if students know that they have an authentic audience, if they see that their work is meaningful to their peers and to the students who will come after them, um, it's not gonna work for every kid every day, but I feel like it's a big piece of the puzzle is knowing that your work is meaningful, that your work is valued, that it has more impact than just whatever letter grade your teacher decides to put on it. My other big lesson is that teachers are good borrowers, but not sharers. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I mean, teachers are used to working um, under fair use or maybe adjacent to fair use with copyrighted material. They're really good at taking stuff and adapting it to meet the needs of their students. That's something that is not a problem at all. But because they're so used to working with copyrighted material, it doesn't always occur to them that if they've adapted an OER, they should share that with other people. If I've got a fourth grade teacher who's taken a high school level text and brought it down to her kid's level, that is a hugely valuable resource for other elementary school teachers and should absolutely be fed back into these, these um, repositories and things. And so just making that connection for these teachers that what you're doing is really good work, not just for your kids, but for other teachers out there who could use what you have, who don't have to reinvent the wheel because you've done this work for them. Um, and so if we can have some more K-12 geared repositories that make it really easy for teachers to see how they can upload and share their material, I think that would be a huge help because this is, this is new territory for them to have stuff that they can really remix and then distribute without having to worry about someone sending them a cease and desist letter. Okay. So this is uh, just some selected resources that I have that I found useful in these particular areas for the theories I'm using, professional development generally and OER. Um, and then this is a poster version of, of the, the slide deck that I had made earlier for a research week. Um, I am happy to answer questions. And if we don't have any questions, I'll just talk about this stuff. So, so I am happy to hear questions, suggestions, anything. Thanks, Beck. Um, lovely to be here. Um, I can't believe that it's been um, sort of since the Delft GoGN seminar in 2018 that I last talked about um, what I'm up to <laughs> with, the, with this PhD to, at the, um, to the sort of GoGN um, audience. Um, and, um, and so, you know, it's been, I've been do at this for a while. Um, it's still 
somewhat ongoing, very much ongoing. <laughs> um, and um, but um, it'll be a bit of an update for those who've um, ever heard anything about it before. And um, hopefully not too not too familiar if you've seen me talking about some of this stuff at conferences and things like that recently. So uh, so hi, uh, my name is Leo Hardman. I'm enrolled at the Open University in the UK. Um, to um, study my PhD. I also work in another university in, um, in London. Um, and uh, my research is, um, is about open education policy and um, specifically, as I mentioned in the abstract, um, about the rumored existence of open education policy in higher education institutions. And, um, and as I, as I just mentioned, I've been working for a long time in different higher education institutions. So my, my interest in this topic really grew out, out of this experience, um, in particular working in, um, in one, um, my, my, my last job rather than my current job where I was working for 10 years um, in, um, in a university that had uh, not really an open education policy or much discussion of open education um, going on. But in other senses, it could be seen as an open university because it, um, it's one where students come and st study through um, evening classes, and basically enable study for uh, people who wouldn't be able to otherwise attend um, attend face to face education um, during kind of um, normal kind of working hours. And so, um, so I thought that was interesting because um, there's not much discussion of openness or open practices, but in some ways everything that's that, that's happening in that organization is um, is kind of uh, open in, in another sense. Um, and so I was um, always quite interested in the idea of OEP and what what are its what it what is its breadth and limits as a concept and how does this fit into open education um, policy, which um, as I will kind of um, discuss a little bit more, tends to focus a bit more um, narrowly, um, mostly on um, OER. So yeah, so in this institution that I was working in, um, there, were, there were people around, like occasional people who were doing some digital open practices um, and OER open courses, students working openly on the kind of, you know, non-disposable assignments and things like this. So, um, so in a sense, this was an institution that didn't have an open education policy. Maybe policy isn't needed, but I, I kind of feel like um, the number of people who were doing these kind of digital open practices wasn't that large. There, there wasn't a huge awareness of these possibilities. It was a bit of a niche activity. And sometimes while there was internal recognition um, of these kind of practices from um, th through teaching awards and things like that, um, I felt frustrated that it wasn't really recognized at a, um, at a higher level that it would be valuable to support and enable and scale up those kinds of practices in the institution. So my, initially, I was thinking about researching this particular context to understand why people are doing um, different forms of OEP, despite not necessarily getting encouragement or support or, or reward. Um, but then um, as I progressed on this, uh, down this journey a bit further, I kind of changed direction and I thought it would be um, useful to find out about institutions which are making policy and encouraging and supporting these activities um, and figuring out what kind of policy is made and what good policy, maybe what good policy looks like. So um, an initial problem was um, how to get a sense of the wider landscape of open education policy. Um, to figure out what existing policies are out there that, that we know about. And I say we, because along with um, uh, my frequent collaborator and friend, um, Javier Atenas, I started doing some work with the OER World Map project, which um, collects information about anything to do with OER um, that's happening anywhere in the world. Um, and um, the map had kind of relatively recently inherited a collection of um, information about policies from Creative Commons who said, um, you know, you would be a better kind of um, place to, to um, look after this information and, and, and make it findable. And um, so they created a sort of new section called the policy registry. And um, we started a process of searching for and adding more policies to this and also uh, developing the registry actually kind of into a separate site, um, which became known as the Open Education Policy Hub. Um, so we were starting to have a lot more items on the map 
and more sense of the landscape. And in kind of thinking about this idea of landscapes and maps, um, it, it, it made me, it reminded me of a phrase that I quite like that um, it is the map is not the territory, um, which is a quote from a philosopher called Al Alfred Korzybski. Um, and I think this reminds us that it's hard to know reality, that, um, that we simplify and summarize the real and make a representation of it um, like a map, or we, we try to produce an overview that we might refer to as a landscape. Um, but in doing so, we remove so much and we select so little. Um, and so it's really important always to think about who's making the map, what makes it through their filter, that maps also privilege certain kinds of um, certain kinds of information. So, you know, they'll highlight often things like borders and highways and, um, you know, superstores. Um, and, um, and, and the map may, makers may fail to represent or even kind of see things that are very important to someone else. And I think that this is quite um, relevant to policy as well, because in some senses, policy making is a kind of a roadmap that's supposed to show you how to get from here to there. But sometimes the policy maps that we make um, are actually of uh, kind of little known or unseen territory. And, um, and so this could be a, this could be a problem um, when you start trying to follow a map that doesn't act adequately represent the territory that you're trying to um, traverse. Um, it could be a, an interruption to your journey. You might find yourself uh, unable to proceed and turning back. Um, and so I thought it's quite important um, not only to look at policies, but also at, at, at people in this study. Um, so in trying to find out more about the kind of local level policy making that we do in institutions and the relationship between policy and practice um, on the ground, um, as it were, um, and also between that institutional policy level and um, kind of other levels at which policy is made. Um, it, it also meant that I needed to think a bit more about what is even meant by the idea of policy and open education policy. So, um, so what are open education policies? Um, this is a definition that um, I co-wrote with, um, with Javier and, um, and some, some other authors when we um, wrote some guidelines for um, co-creating policy. And, um, and this really my um, kind of reading and my thinking about the topic fed into this quite a bit. So what we um, came up with was that open education policies are written or unwritten guidelines, regulation, regulations and strategies. Uh, which seek to foster the development and implementation of open educational practices, including the creation and use of open educational resources. Um, and through such policies, um, governments, institutions, and other organizations allocate resources and orchestrate activities in order to increase access to educational opportunity, as well as promote educational quality, efficiency, and innovation. So what, what I really wanted to get across, what we wanted to get across in this definition was the idea that, that, that the policy that you can find that is, that is written down somewhere is kind of not the only policy that exists. And um, so it could, be, it could be unwritten. It could be policy in the sense that we've all kind of agreed this and we, it, it's, it's, not, it's not written anywhere, but it's the way that we're doing things in our organization. Um, or just the way that always things have always been done. Or so in, also, it can be a case of where um, there, there's funding allocated to certain kinds of activities. Um, in, in that sense, there may not be a written policy that says we believe in doing these activities so much as simply um, the, the, the funding has been put in place to enable those to happen, um, to support those to happen. So that, I th you know, I think that that kind of qualifies as a form of policy, whether it's um, explicitly articulated or not. So of course, this is a m bit more difficult to understand than, um, than a, just a, a kind of a policy document where all of this is written and um, explicitly defined. And so how do these institutional policies fit into the kind of, I guess, a bigger picture? Um, one of the, the ideas that um, Javier and I came up with was that we can think about the 
um, layers as a kind of a pyramid. Um, and, you know, we quite often think about supranational and national as kind of above um, and institutions as below. But in a way, um, really, the, we, um, maybe it's more helpful to think about the, the supranational. And here I'm talking about in, organizations like um, UNESCO, who have, you know, been, uh, who, who've done a lot of leading on open educational resources in particular. Um, that they put a kind of a, a, a kind of a strategy or vision or um, kind of call upon um, upon member states to do certain kinds of things, and so that that acts as a kind of a foundation from from which the um, at the national level you might then start to see policy being made, and then this should kind of flow through in terms of, um, of funding um, for these kinds of activities into making um, activity. Um, more, you know, not not making it happen, but making it more possible um, in the um, institutional level. That's maybe how it how it should be working. But in practice, maybe I think we see more interest in this topic um, there at the at the supranational level and with with kind of local actors some of the time in institutions and in, in more more in some places than than in others. But definitely a lot of a lot of activity that does go on there. Um, and maybe the national level is um, uh, the, the, the message about this is maybe not yet permeating um, and, and turning into um, national level policy so, so much. So in terms of um, what, what are we finding out from reviewing the landscape um, of, the, of the policies that have been collected into the um, the registry. But in terms of the types of policies that are around, um, an awful lot are dedicated um, open education or OER policy. Usually, you, usually OER is the focus of any of the open education slash OER. Um, sometimes these are more general educational policies that, that make reference to open education. So there's a, an open education component. Um, sometimes they're openness policies, so thinking about kind of other kinds of um, openness, like open access um, and, and those the open science, these kind of things where there is a also reference to how this uh, relates to educational activity and other kinds of um, areas like ICT and um, labour market policies that again reference open education. Um, in terms of the, 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 this is really just thinking about the, looking at the volume of the policies um, that have been, that have been collected. Um, in, we, we have a lot in North America, a lot in Europe, um, other regions of the world, um, not as many as, um, as, as you, as you'd hope. Does this mean that they are not there. I mean, it's it's we can't say for certain, but it's um it's possible that they they simply are, are not there, or that we haven't found them yet. But um, especially um, we're thinking about um you know Asia, for example. Um, we're talking about a lot of countries, huge populations. So um so it would be definitely interesting to find out more about what's going on. But equally e everywhere. It'd be interesting to find out more about what's going on. Um, in terms of what kind of focus these uh, policies have in these across these different regions, um, what we notice that North American policies um, are it tends to be more focused towards open textbooks. So, um, so sort of OER, yes, but in particular that um, Europe OER a bit more um, generalized um, level. Um, South America the only region where there's a little bit more, um, uh, tends to be more of a mixed OER and OEP kind of style of reference coming through in policy and, um, and other regions um, OER focused. So overall thinking about this landscape so far, just, no, just thinking about um, kind of the, the headline sort of findings from um, what policy documents are about here mainly. Um, the open education policies are still, although there are there are there are quite quite a few policies, it's still by no means the norm. Uh, it's not like this is 
um, surfacing across uh, the majority of institutions um, or nations. So still thin on the ground at the national and institutional levels. Um, open education policies tend to be OER focused. Um, thinking about OEP as practices that relate to and support OER, then you might say, yeah, that's sort of often included with an OER focused policy. That, that would be true, but there's also a wider range of practices which um, are open practices which tend to be a bit less um, less referenced in, in policy. Um, and, and of course, um, as I've kind of hinted earlier, taking a wider view of what we mean by the idea of um, open education policy, um, these documented written policies are kind of the tip of a, of a policy iceberg. If we're thinking more about the um, how policies as um, the way that the way that things are done, rather than necessarily a document. So, um, so I, I've kind of um, reached the point where I have quite a quite a bit of knowledge about the the um, wider landscape. Of the, especially of those um, policy documents. Um, and now I'm wanting to um, find out some things which I think really can really are going to require um, the, the views of, of people. So this is kind of moving into the, um, as the, the, the ethics process calls it, the, um, the um, research with um, human um, participants. Um, and um, and so what I'm wanting to find out really from people are what are the key drivers of institutional open education policies in, in their own organizations. Um, have the, and um, this was a kind of a, the, the middle question here um, has kind of come about because I felt like it was, it would be, it would be strange and, um, and kind of um, really um, not, it, 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 would, it would be quite odd to be researching this topic and not acknowledge that um, we've been um, in the midst of and still have not emerged from a global pandemic. And that um, this has led to a lot of calls for people to adopt various kind of open resources and open practices, um, which have not necessarily always um, been, I think, the, the, you know, these calls have not necessarily always been heard by all the right people, but I would like to investigate the extent to which there has been any kind of moving the dial uh, in terms of open education policy making as a result of the pandemic. Um, and certainly, um, I think that what you know, one of the examples of this that I would refer to, or uh, examples where I am seeing an impact, is in the enormous cost of um, e textbooks in the UK, which Traditionally, you know, the the um, libraries in the UK have um, have paid for the access and the burden of the cost of paying for textbooks has been uh, has been falling less on the individual student than in some other countries. And hence, there has been this kind of sense that the the open textbooks maybe are, you know, that the, the urgency of them in the UK has been has been less. Um, but in the context where we all suddenly were um, learning and teaching online, um, students were often unable to access the um, physical library and physical books, um, then we've seen a kind of a, a, a brief um, respite where a lot of publishers made content available, uh, sort of swathes of content available for free. And then, um, but that was very, very kind of short lived and then then very soon after it was, um, well, we're now charging for this again. And it's not just full price, it's actually much more than the previous price. And so it was, there was kind of a sense in the, um, amongst the librarians that um, now, now that they, they had us over a barrel, they were going to um, seriously overcharge. And I think that this has driven a lot more uh, discussion about um, what can we do about um, open resources. So I think that's going to be a, a, quite an interesting, um, not originally planned, but kind of now added um, line of inquiry for this research. Um, and ultimately, um, 
I'm, I'm trying to see what I can find out about the relationship between policy and practice. And so, um, so my next steps, um, and the, and I've, I've called this next steps and cry for help, <laughs> because um, I, I know um, as a as now a re relatively long-standing member of GoGN that um, that th this network is absolutely wonderful at emotional support, and I, I, I already know I rely on you for that. But um, but I will also ask for some <laughs> some other more practical help as well. Um, so my next steps are I'm going to um, survey higher education staff um, where um, I'm going to be asking about their perception of um, local policy drivers and the process um, and, um, and really lo looking into, um, you know, the extent to which they feel that there is policy and, and, and what, what is it, what is it aiming to do. Um, and I also um, after that, we'll be looking to interview um, staff members who have been involved in policy making. So they, so uh, and and that will be interesting because I haven't really completely narrowed down like what type of people these would be because I think in some contexts the policy might be um, that there might be a very small number of people involved in it. In other cases, it it might be more of a, um, a co-created um, policy that might have various people involved. Um, so I am uh, appealing to um, to members of GoGN um, to um, first of all please um, do complete my survey when I finally release it, um, which hopefully will be quite soon. Um, do um, please um, feel free to pass it along to anyone who you think would have um, some views to share, and um, and do let me know if you can think of. Um, someone who would be um, great to interview for the interview stage of this study. And uh, thank you so much for listening.